I want to thank God for the opportunity to be here to speak with you today. Once again, thank you to your leadership team for the invitation to speak. And I pray that as we pray together, that God would speak through me. His message would respond to the needs of your hearts. And we would be encouraged in our walk with God. Our topic for this presentation is entitled, Looking, Looking for the Ordinary, Seeing the Extraordinary. And because I have used the word looking and seeing, undoubtedly, you would have recognized it must have something to do with sight. How do we see? I remember many years ago, I had a surgery on one eye, and then a few years later, I had another surgery on the other eye. The surgery was to remove what was called a pterygium, and after the surgeon operated by peeling off this pterygium, which was an extra growth on the surface of the eye, he then <laughs> cut a portion of my eyeball. I hope this doesn't gross you out. Because just thinking about it grosses me out. That he would trim a portion of my eyeball like a, like a graft and saw that piece onto the eyeball where he had taken off that extra growth of skin. I can remember you know, coming home with this patch over my eye after the surgery and wondered if hoping that when the patch came off that I would be able to see. I felt awful. A few weeks later, however, by the grace of God, I was in Huntsville, Alabama, driving through a rainstorm to Atlanta, Georgia, four hours or more drive. And I can recall <laughs> thinking, I can barely see because I'm still recovering. The patch was off, but here's this horrible rainstorm. And if you've ever driven through a rainstorm like that, you know, it's not an easy thing to do. The spray from the trucks, it's almost as if you're driving in a fog. Being able to see is an ability that all people value. Just the joy of waking up in the morning, knowing that we can see. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for giving us eyesight. But help us to look beyond the ordinary, so that we can see the extraordinary. This is our prayer. We've asked it in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. I want to thank God for his opportunity to be here. And the text that we read this morning is from the Gospel of John, one of my favorite uh, books of the Bible. And in John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. Actually, that was a text that was one of the texts read, but I want to read in, instead John chapter 21 and verse 25. That's John chapter 21 and verse 25. It says, and there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that could be written. And so John here laid out that everything recorded in scriptures, everything recorded in scripture is important. And God had a plan for putting it there and so that as we read, we could be encouraged in our faith walk with Jesus Christ. 
And I've, having read that, I now want to read uh, chapter 20 and verse 30 and 31. And the text says, And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But those that are written, so remember now, the, the, the previous passage said that Jesus did so many things that if we were to record everything he did, if we were to record everything that Jesus did, the world could not contain the number of books that would have to be written to describe what Jesus did. So why did we record some of those things that Jesus did? Why did the Apostle John create a recording in addition to that which was already done by Matthew and by Mark and that which is also done by Luke? Why did John believe that he needed to write a gospel? of the life of Jesus Christ, choosing particular elements of the life of Jesus Christ. He had a message. And so verse 31 says, and here is John's reason for writing it, but these are written. It's Matthew, John 20, verse 31. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Why were these things written? That you and I would believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. Just imagine, just imagine how good it would be if as Christian followers, we could see Jesus. How good it would be if you, we, we, we had the opportunity that when, 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 when we have a problem, if Jesus was here with us and we could go over to see him to solve our problems and to get our questions answered. There you are having a difficulty. There you are having a challenge. There you are having some issues that you need to respond to. And you're not sure what decision you should make. You're not sure whether you should go left or go right. Wouldn't it be good if we could see Jesus? Go over to him and say, Jesus, how do I answer this problem? You know, the ability to see, the ability to see occurs when light passes through our cornea. Then it goes through the iris and the pupil to bend and be focused by the lens of our eyes onto the photoreceptor cells of the retina at the back of our eyes. This reception of light that now becomes focused onto the receptor is changed into an electrical signal, which then journeys via the optic nerve to the brain where it is converted into the image that we see. So if we would see Jesus, all of this process of light passing into the eye to be focused by the, the lens of the eye onto the photoreceptor, which would then transport it by the optic nerve to the brain, where the image would then be received, in fact, upside down, but the, the brain has its way of making sure that we don't see upside down, but that we can see whatever we're looking at right side up. That's how the physical process would have to be if we were to use our eyes today to see Jesus. But I'm here to tell you today, according to John, we don't have to physically see Jesus and touch Jesus to believe that he is our God, he is our creator, he is our savior, and he is our friend. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 11, Paul says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. Without faith, it is impossible to experience him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. 
powerful text, powerful text. If we would see God with more than just our physical eyes, we have to believe in him, that he is a rewarder of those who diligently, diligently, earnestly, with every fiber of our being, seek him. And so in the Gospel of John, this is one of the themes that we don't have to physically see Jesus or touch Jesus in order to experience him as our Lord and God and Savior. There are two experiences in John that makes this very clear. And I, I'm just going to reference those now. You may want to read those when you go on. In fact, the Gospel of John doesn't have a lot of parables like Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John hardly records any parable at all. But John's stories that he uses are like parables. And here is one of the parables he gave. John gave a story of Jesus encountering a man who was born blind. Had never seen since he was a child. He was now a big man, over 40 years old. Had never seen all his life, for he had been born blind. And when Jesus healed him of his sight, the 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 fire, it was on a, on a Sabbath. The man was in the temple. He had gone to church just praising God. Thank God! Can you imagine how you would be excited if you found out that though you had been born blind, Jesus had given you the opportunity now to see. And so he was worshiping God, praising God. But the, the Jews and the Pharisees got upset because he had been healed on the Sabbath. And so they, they questioned this man, who gave you your sight? How is it that now you can see? They sent for his parents to ask his parents, is this your son? They said, yes. Was he born blind? They said, yes. They asked him, now how can he see? The parent says, we don't know. He's of age. Ask him. And so when the, they asked the man, the man says, Jesus touched me and now I can see. And so they, they began to argue with Jesus. They began to fuss with Jesus. How dare he do this miracle on the Sabbath day? And so as they argued with him, John chapter 9, verse 39, Jesus makes this point. And Jesus said, for judgment, I have come into this world that those who do not see may see and those who see may be born blind. For judgment, I have come into the world that those who do not see may see and those who see may be, may be made blind. And if you're following me carefully, if you're understanding where John is going, you are perhaps now recognizing that Jesus was not necessarily talking about the physical eyesight. That Jesus was giving the, the Pharisees a lesson. That you who claim that you can see because you know the scriptures, you are actually blind. But here is a man who was blind. Here's somebody who had never seen all his life. Here's somebody who perhaps had never had the opportunity to experience God. But when he encountered Jesus, he accepted Jesus. By faith, he was healed. By faith, he could now see. And what he's now seeing is not just what he can see with his physical eyes. What he is now seeing, he's able to see that Jesus is not just a man walking amongst us, but that he is God and savior and creator and redeemer of our world. And so Jesus gave them that as a parable, demonstrating that what we need if we would see Jesus is more than our physical eyesight. The Pharisees had physical eyesight, but they, they didn't see who Jesus was. The other story in John chapter 20, where Philip, not, not, not Philip, Thomas, after Jesus' resurrection, Thomas heard that Jesus had appeared to the other disciples, that Jesus was resurrected and had appeared physically to other disciples. 
And Thomas was determined that he would not believe it. I'm not going to believe it. That is impossible. That is not at all possible. That would be too extraordinary. What you saw must have been a ghost. What you saw was perhaps somebody else who was deep faking who Jesus was. What you saw was not Jesus. I would have to touch him for myself. I would have to see him for myself in order to believe him. And the Bible tells us in John chapter 20 that when Jesus appeared before the other disciples and before Thomas. And he said to Thomas, come, touch my side. Come, feel the nail prints in my hand. And then Thomas fell before him and said, oh Lord, now I believe. And here's what Jesus then said to Thomas. Jesus said to Thomas, Thomas, because you have seen me, that's John 20, verse 29. Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Because belief does not depend on our eyesight. It is more than just a physical phenomenon. With our natural eyesight, we can see the ordinary. But with the eyes of faith, as we understand who Jesus is, he allows us to see the extraordinary. And so what we need, what we need is faith, not better eyesight. What we need is faith, not 2020 vision. What we need is faith, not the latest pair of glasses with all of the photo uh, uh, additional things to it so that it could dim in the light and, and, and lighten in, 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 in the darkness so that you could see better. What we need is not a better pair of glasses. What we need is faith in Jesus Christ. Experiencing Jesus with every fiber of our being is better than just physically seeing an image of Jesus. That's what we need. Have you ever experienced a, a soul numbing death of a loved one? Somebody you won't see again. A child, a parent, a, a sibling, a close friend, or perhaps maybe you have been deathly sick on the verge of death, diagnosed with a terminal illness. How does the idea of death make you feel? There is such a finality to death. It seems to erase who we are. It seems to erase our very existence. The very essence of our presence is gone. Our dreams are wiped out. My first real traumatic experience with death was the death of a grandmother. I was just about eight or nine when my grandmother died. And I remember recalling as we were walking towards the, 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 the graveyard and this was way back in the 19 almost somewhere around 1970 when my grandmother died and I remember as I was walking as a child over to the graveyard in the country at the back of my grandfather's farm where the body was to be buried where they had the funeral uh, and burial of other family and relatives that I it suddenly struck me that I would not see her again. And I remember how I felt that brokenness all of a sudden, that I would lose the ability to interact, to see, to experience my grandmother. The finality of it struck me hard as I eight or nine years old. So now imagine how the disciples felt when Jesus died. They had invested everything in Jesus. You see, the disciples were like a Jewish nas nationalist. Jesus was the right kind of a leader they were looking for. The people, yes, the people loved him. Look at the crowds that followed him. He was qualified with unusual and exceptional powers that could be used to lead an insurrection against the Romans and set up a Jewish kingdom. The disciples all expected that they would be rewarded when this happened. And that's why Peter was armed with a sword 
and took off the ear of the servant of the high priest. To us today, the word Messiah is a spiritual terminology. And so when we think of Messiah and Messianic, we are thinking of somebody outside of this world. But to the disciples, a Messiah was like Che Guevara or Mesotong in, in China, or like Castro in Cuba, or like Lenin. It's that kind of a revolutionary leadership. Someone they could follow for a reward when he overthrew the status quo. And so the disciples had given up families and friends and professions and religions. Have some of us given up some of those things to follow Jesus? We, 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 we could have been rich and lived in Beverly Hills. We could have been rich and lived in some of the, 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 the greater places in our world. But we have given those up to follow Jesus. But that Thursday, when Jesus rode the donkey into Jerusalem, the disciples were excited. Yes, this was why they had followed Jesus. This was why they gave up all of those things to follow Jesus. He was about to overthrow the Romans and the status quo, and they were going to be given special places of honor in his kingdom. They were ready to crown Jesus king in Jerusalem. The insurrection had begun. But by sunset, by sunset Friday evening, it was all over. If they thought Jesus was about to, 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 to push for a coup against the rulers, they were disappointed. They thought Jesus was about to instigate an insurrection, they were disappointed. Jesus had died without hardly a whimper. So now there were no kingdom rewards. Now they had no positions of high honor. Now they were so fearful that they would now be arrested and executed as his followers that they scattered and fled into hiding. To the upper room, the scripture says, they went back to hide. Is this it? All that preaching of the doctrines of a different kingdom, is this it? After all the healing of the sick and the resurrection of the dead, is this it? After feeding thousands with just fish and bread, is this it? After all the crowds that followed him, I am asking, is this it? All their expectations dead, their hopes destroyed. They had given up so much to follow Jesus. Is this how it will end? They would not see him alive again, they thought. The disciples were devastated. Believe me, I don't think they had vespers on that Friday night. I don't believe that they went to church the next Sabbath, that Sabbath. But the Bible records. And John had a purpose for recording these events. And the question is, how is the story in John chapter 20? Is where I'm going to pick it up now. How is the story of Jesus' resurrection on that Sunday morning going to get us to believe that Jesus is the Son of God? So I want to close with three points. Point number one. Don't come looking for traditions. Come to experience salvation. Let me say that again. When we come to Jesus, when we come to church as we understand it, don't come looking for traditions. Come to experience salvation. Another way we can say that, that oftentimes people read their Bibles 
for information. But as Christians, we are not to read the Bible for information. We read the scriptures for transformation. In the beginning, the scripture says in John 1, was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. So when we read the word, it's not just as the following of traditions. It is not just as a means of information. What we are doing, we are looking for salvation. We want to experience transformation. And so in John chapter 20, the Bible describes how Mary went to the tomb on that Sunday morning. The tomb is the home of the dead. She was not expecting a risen Jesus. Mary went to look for a dead Jesus. Are you with me? She was anxious to complete her mourning. Things that occurred so quickly on Friday evening. Jesus had hurriedly been buried before the sunset. On Sabbath, they had gone into hiding. Perhaps they might have had their own personal worship, but they dare not go to the temple. But early Sunday morning, before the day had even, the dawn had broken and the first light of the dawn had started to show. Mary was anxious to complete her mourning determined to make sure all the cultural norms, all the cultural norms were followed. She went early while it was still dark. She took with her spices and ointments to prepare. What kind of passion, what kind of religious piety did it take for Mary, a woman in a society where women mostly depend on men. But here Mary, with all of her religious piety and passion, did not wait on Peter, did not wait on Matthew, did not wait on John. But Mary got up early before daybreak. Perhaps she had to have a torch light. And that Sunday morning, she prepared water to wash the body of Jesus and packed the required pounds of spices and ointments to embalm the body of Jesus. For Mary was going to the tomb for a dead Jesus, not to see the miracle of a resurrection. She was going to see the ordinary, not to experience the extraordinary. I ask you today, is your Christian experience dependent on traditions and rituals? Or is it based on the confidence that you know Jesus for you have a living relationship with him? I preach that. I'm asking that because as a Seventh-day Adventist baptized when I was only nine years old, as the seventh day Adventist, I know how we are. We put so much, so much piety and passion sometimes in our traditions. We like to put the furnishings of the sanctuary of the church and the rituals of our services, even our communion services, and the traditions of our order of service, way, way, way above the reality of having a genuine faith-based experience with Jesus. For some of us, the pastor breaking the communion bread is more important than experiencing Jesus, the bread of life. I remember one Sabbath when I pastored in Jamaica, one of the churches that I pastored. I had just gotten married. <laughs> My wife, being from Bermuda, we went to, I, I, I came back after having gotten married. And that first Sabbath in that church, we were having communion service. 
I was introducing my wife to the church. Can you imagine how I felt? <clears throat> my beautiful brand new wife. I felt like I was walking in cloud nine. We were having a communion service. I felt like I was walking on cloud nine with Jesus. I was so excited. We had a beautiful service, a communion. I remember we walked out of church in this small community in the country. And as we walked out of church, one of my members in the church had a big fight in the church yard with his cousin, who was also a member of the church, right before where, where the whole community was passing by. Many times we are so much more, give so much more reverence to our rituals and our, even, our, even how the tablecloth should be folded for the communion service versus our relationship with Jesus Christ. But I want to ask you, are you serving a dead Jesus? Or are you worshiping a living, resurrected God? Mary was so determined to fulfill her rituals and follow the Jewish traditions that even when all evidences pointed to Jesus that he was resurrected, she could not believe it. The tomb was open when she got there. The body was missing when she got there. She saw an angel. She thought it was the gardener. She saw Jesus. <laughs> but because she was not expecting to see Jesus, because she wasn't looking by faith with spiritual eyesight, she was only looking with her ordinary eyeballs. So what she saw, though it was Jesus she was talking to, she couldn't believe it was Jesus. Because she was not looking for a resurrection. She was looking for a dead Jesus. Too often, as I said, we pay more attention to the things that we can see with our physical eyesight than pay attention to the spiritual lessons that God has in store for us. So blind Mary was that when Jesus spoke to her, she didn't even recognize him. It was not until he said, Mary, his voice probably agonized in pain that she understood that she was not talking to the gardener. She was talking to Jesus. How are you looking for Jesus this morning? Have you seen him? For who he is. So beloved. I say again. This point. Don't come looking. For traditions. But come to experience. Salvation. Sometimes we're looking. For so much tradition. That we miss seeing. The salvation. Point number two. Don't come to Jesus. To see the ordinary. Come to see. The extraordinary. When you come to church. Do you just come out of fashion? Do you just come out of tradition? Or do you come to see and experience a miracle? One of the challenges I have with our churches, many of our churches, you know, I've been to churches, I've pastored churches. I go to churches and we see the bulletins of the order of service. And in those bulletins, we have lists of people that are listed requesting prayer because they are sick. We're requesting prayer because of issues. Let's pray for sister so-and-so because she is sick. And sister so-and-so, God heard our prayer, healed our prayer. She's been in church for the last month. Her name is still in the bulletin asking us to pray for sister so-and-so is sick. And nobody has said, allow her to just testify one Sabbath of the goodness of Jesus and what he has done in her life. Oh, we are so scripted sometimes that we have no place for the extraordinary, no places for miracle. And some of us would ask, does God still do miracle? And I can testify that he is still a God who does miracle. But when we're looking with our ordinary physical eyeballs, sometimes we look past the miracle 
and we don't understand that we serve a God who does miracle, he is extraordinary. The text said, when Mary came, she simply saw the physical scene before her. The, 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 the Greek word is blepe. And I, I'm just quoting that to give you, because I'm going to give you a little context for that now. It's an active verb, which means to be able to have the ability, the faculty of sight. So Mary, Mary merely had the ability to see what was before her. And so when she came to the tomb, and I thought, I, I would like to believe she came with a torch because it was just on the cusp of dawn. It was probably still dark. And when she came to the tomb, the stone was rolled away. That's what she saw. The tomb was empty. That's what she saw. She didn't go in. She looked. Stone was rolled. Can you imagine how frightened she was? The stone was rolled away. She held her light. She looked in. She realized that Jesus' body was not there. Somebody had moved the body. And here is what I believe, based on the fact that she was just looking with her physical eyes. Here is what I believe Mary was thinking. Maybe. The soldiers had moved the body. Maybe grave robbers had moved the body. Maybe Pilate or Herod had moved the body. Maybe the high priests had moved the body. Mary's concern was, where is the dead body of Jesus? Are you with me? Are you with me? That's what she was worried about. Where is the dead body of Jesus? That's what she was looking for. She was not looking for the extraordinary. She was looking for the ordinary. After all, my friends, when somebody dies <laughs> and you go to a funeral, we don't go to look for the resurrection. We go to look for their funeral services. We go to see the body placed in the ground. And we have seen that over and over and over again. We have cried at funerals of our loved ones, of our friends. That is the ordinary human experience. That is what Mary was expecting when she went to the tomb. But when she got there that Sunday morning, it was Jesus. That's whom she saw. Jesus. Beloved, but before she understood it was Jesus. Mary went back and told Peter and John that the body wasn't there. The, 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 these two disciples, John was a little younger. John was a little faster when Mary gave them the news. They both took off to the garden where the tomb was. And when they got there, John ahead of, ahead of Peter, John stood outside and he peered in. And all John saw was what Mary also saw. He too, by then, perhaps the morning light had come up a little brighter. He saw the empty tomb. He saw the burial clothes of Jesus left in the empty tomb. The word that was used for the ability to see for John is the same word that was used for Mary Blepi. First Mary and now John look with just the perspectives of their ability to see things physically. And because their human perspective was the lens through which they engaged the tomb, all they saw was an empty tomb. John was trying to make sense of what he saw. What happened overnight? Where is Jesus' body? What happened here last night? Who rolled the stone away? But then along comes Peter. And Peter rushed up. You know Peter who jumped out of the boat to walk on water. Peter who when they were fishing and caught that large group of fish. He also jumped out of the boat and swam to the shore. When he realized it was Jesus who had performed that miracle. Peter came 
walked right into the tomb. He too saw the burial clothes and the head wrapped neatly folded. The words here describe how Peter saw what Peter, how, how Peter saw is different from the word used for John and for Mary. The Greek word describing how Peter processed what he saw is theorai, which means he saw in a contemplative way. He saw with careful observance of what he saw. Not just that the tomb was empty, but even that what happened, Jesus' burial clothes was left as if his body had simply vanished out of his clothes. He saw more than what Mary and John had seen. For Peter was not just looking at the scene physically. He began to engage the scene in a different way. Nothing is written in scriptures without a purpose. And in John chapter 20 verse 8, it describes how John himself then finally entered the tomb. And how he saw, but also believed. The Greek word here is different. Now, John initially had seen Lepi like Mary. But now the word described for John when he, after he went in the tomb with Peter is Iden, meaning to understand, to perceive the significance of what he saw. He also saw Jesus' grave clothes lying there as if Jesus' body had simply vanished out of his clothes. And he began to understand that the body had not been stolen. He began to understand that the body had not been hidden. The Zaf Ages says, John did not yet understand the scriptures that Jesus must rise from the dead, but he now began to remember how Jesus had foretold his resurrection. And all that he, they saw was preaching to them loud and clear that Jesus, the Son of God, was risen. But because they came expecting the ordinary, they could not accept the extraordinary. They had become so conditioned by the expected human experience of death that they forgot that this Jesus who raised Jairus' daughter, this Jesus who resurrected the widow's son of Nain, this Jesus who had waited four days to ensure that Lazarus was really dead and then stood outside Lazarus' tomb and commanded, Lazarus, come forth. Yes, they forgot that Jesus is not an ordinary man. No, he is extraordinary. He is the son of God. He is able to walk out of the tomb and to wave and the grave and to wave triumphantly the keys of hell and of death. Oh, death, he is crying out, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? And so when you come to Jesus, my friends, in faith and prayer and worship, do not come like Mary and Peter and John to see death as usual. Come with excitement. Come with joy. Come with expectation. For Jesus is not an ordinary man. No, he is the son of God. And he can do the impossible. And I hope you're hearing me this morning. Come many of us in the way we practice our Christian experience, we just go to church, but we live life physical like everybody else. But I'm saying to you this morning, don't encounter life with just your physical senses. Encounter life with the understanding that we serve a risen Savior, who is Jesus Christ, O Lord. We serve a God who can do even the impossible. The last point. And then I close. You may experience a death or a resurrection, but don't despair. Look with hope. Sorry, let me say that again. You may experience a death or a crucifixion, but don't despair. Look with hope one day for a resurrection. A seed 
must be buried and planted before it can resurrect and grow. Every farmer knows that. Before you can get a seed, before you can get a fruit, a plant, you've got to bury that seed. It's got to be planted in the ground. But then you pray with faith and hope, knowing that there will be a resurrection of a plant and that a fruit will grow. And so, but the disciples didn't get the picture. They were so excited when Jesus marched into Jerusalem on Thursday. They were so despondent when he was crucified and buried on Friday evening. They were devastated. They were not prepared because they weren't looking with spiritual eyesight. They were not prepared for the resurrection. They were not prepared for that which was planted to begin to grow and to be resurrected. But the scripture records that these same apostles, these same disciples who were so despondent and discouraged that after the resurrection, the disciples who before the resurrection couldn't heal a little boy. The father brought her, his son who was demon possessed to the disciples and said, could you heal my son? Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration with three of the disciples. The other nine were there and they tried, but they couldn't heal the little boy. But after the resurrection, they became bold. They became confident in the power of Jesus' name. After the resurrection, Peter preached and 2,000 people were baptized. After the resurrection, Peter's shadow, Peter's handkerchief was healing people. After the resurrection, beloved, if we come looking with spiritual eyes, not with our physical eyes, to encounter the impossible, to encounter the extraordinary, like the disciples, we can become bold and confident, knowing that we live in the after the resurrection period. And so we can have faith that the God we serve is an awesome God. He is a God of the impossible. To the church today, the hymn says, I serve a risen Savior. He is in the world today. Do you know? Do you know that he is living? Whatever men may say. Do you see his hand of mercy? Do you hear his voice of cheer? And just and just the time we need him. He's always there. He lives. He's not dead. He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. We can walk with him and talk with him. We may not do so physically, but every time you pick up the word of God, you are encountering Jesus. And we've got to encounter him, not just with the eyes that read mere words. We have to encounter him, not just that we can stand up in Sabbath school to say, I know what the Bible says, but we should encounter him with our hearts touched by the power of Jesus Christ. For when the word that was made flesh dwells in our heart, we will see with eyes that are more than physical. We will see with eyes that are spiritual. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Is he your resurrection and the life? Philippians 3 verse 10, Paul says, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. It is time for the church. It is time for us to know him and the power of his resurrection. Don't go to the tomb. Don't go to church. Don't come to worship looking for a dead Jesus. We are here today because he is risen. He is risen. He is alive. He is the resurrection and the life. So even in death, we despair. But the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 4, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself, that same Jesus who was dead, that same Jesus who Mary went to, looking for as a dead Jesus. That same Jesus, because he is risen and he is alive, shall so come, shall descend from heaven. 
with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, he says, comfort one another with these words. Paul also says, 1 Corinthians 15, 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. We shall be changed, for this corruptible will one day put on incorruption. This mortal will put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, O death, <laughs> hallelujah, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, the strength of sin is the law. But like Peter and like John, and like Mary, one day we will be able to stand at the entrance of our tomb when Jesus comes and calls us home. And we will be able to say, but thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Because we looked not just with eyes made of physical cells, but we are now looking and experiencing Jesus with spiritual eyesight. We can then say, but thanks be to God who gives us victory. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Beloved. If Jesus. Means more. Than just. A history lesson. If to you Jesus. Is more. Than just. A story we read up in the Bible. If to you Jesus. Should be. Our encounter. Not just reading the word. So we know. For we are not reading the word. For information. But encountering the word. Looking for personal life. Changing spiritual transformation. If that's your desire. Wouldn't you just rest your hands on your heart. And let me pray right now to close. Oh Jesus. May we. Experience you. Not just with physical eyes, but with spiritual eyes. May we see you, not as a dead God, but as a living Savior. Be patient with us, Lord, while we grow. And as we grow to experience you fully, like the disciples and Mary, may we rejoice and say, thank God for our risen Savior in our world today. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Somebody say amen.